Did they not know what they were doing? Are we also guilty of not knowing the harm or extent of our deeds or misdeeds? Most often I think we don't know fully. And who are the they and them that Jesus refers to? His first words on the cross stress the way toward graceful mercy, forgiveness, and peace. We take our place among the guilty, Caiaphas, Pilate, the Roman soldiers, a callous government, Peter, Judas, for we are all guilty. The kind of guilt that allows us to deny certain truths because we are afraid. The guilt that sells out a friend for a few dollars or an opportunity or even to make ourselves look better in someone else's eyes. Forgive them. Forgive that mob mentality that delights in condemnation even without proof. Forgive the sense of refusing to take a stand or allowing our biases to get the better of us. Father, forgive us for what we do to one another. Most importantly, we witness what Jesus is doing here, how he is telling his story, being consistent, forgiving his enemies, loving his friends and establishing a new way of being. As difficult as it might be, forgiveness is the first step to dying to oneself, the invitation to being Christian. Jesus triumphant entry into Jerusalem the people crowded the sides of the road crying out Hosanna meaning God save us yet just a few days later the scene has reversed Jesus is not triumphantly entering a city but is instead humiliated on a cross the one who is supposed to save the people is now seemingly unable to save himself, much less anyone else. There are two criminals hanging beside Jesus. One of them sees the absurdity of the so-called Savior and mocks him. If you are the Messiah, save yourself and us. But the second criminal apparently see something in this moment that is lost on the first. And with his final strength, he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. To which Jesus responds, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. I do not know what the second criminal saw in Jesus. It doesn't seem as though he was one of those who was a follower, and the fact that he was being crucified makes it likely that he had committed some sort of terrible crime. The writers of our Gospels don't even give him a name, relegating him to the periphery. Yet in his final moments, in the shame and the pain and the disgrace of crucifixion, he sees clearly. Oh, to be able to see clearly in the midst of such suffering. Oh, to be able to see the beauty and grace in life when everything around us in this moment seems to be so grim. In his final moments, this man who we know only as a criminal sees something true, something holy. And Jesus welcomes him home welcomes him into paradise. So is the way of this Jesus, 
even in those last moments, taking on what seemed so lonely and terrifying, even death itself, and transforming it into our salvation, ushering us through it into new life on the other side. God grant us the vision to see this more clearly. As a mother, there are things that I won't allow myself to imagine. The sorrow of watching a child die, let alone so brutally. As holy as Jesus was, he was the son of Mary, bone of her bone, flesh of her flesh. Having traveled through her body, even before conception, her journey with him had been filled with awe and wonder. Now she stands among the ranks of so many mothers and fathers who have witnessed the senseless death of a child cut down too soon, a child murdered for no good reason. Streams of love flow toward her. There is your mother, Jesus says to John, from this day forward, this is your son. And the beloved disciple knows what to do with her. He knows the strain of a woman alone in those days, their vulnerabilities. He knows that to love his dying friend is to love his friend's mother. In community, Jesus entrusts us to one another to be cared for, to be safe, and he places upon that relationship the same value we reserve for our closest kin, son, mother, sister, brother. Our first loyalty is to this new family created out of love. We are kin, we are family. beginning of his ministry, after he was baptized in the Jordan River, Jesus heard the voice of God from the heavens saying, This is my Son, my Beloved, with him I am well pleased. But now Jesus is in a time of crisis. Most of his disciples have abandoned him, Peter has denied him, and the crowds are mocking him. And as he is in agony on the cross, he cries out with what little breath he has left to quote a psalm from his ancestors. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far away from helping me from the words of my groaning? And the answer that Jesus receives is a resounding silence. There is no answer, no reassurance or comfort. This silence of God and the silences of God that we seem to encounter in our lives can be agonizing. No answers, no response. Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? These are questions that spring from our innermost being, questions without any easy answers. 
in the midst of suffering, in the midst of a tragedy, in the midst of a pandemic, we ask, where is God? Why has God forsaken us? But let us be assured that God has not abandoned Jesus. God has not abandoned us. No, God is with Jesus on the cross. God is with Jesus in those ventilators, struggling still to breathe. Six hours of brutality have passed, and that body, once perfect, is beaten, battered, and scarred, just like the prophet Isaiah had foretold. His form, disfigured, has lost all the likeness of a man. His beauty has changed beyond human semblance. Tormented and humbled by suffering, we beheld him of no account, a thing from which all turn away their eyes. He now says, I am thirsty. A jar stands nearby full of sour wine, and so they soaked a sponge made from a hyssop branch, dipped it into the wine and held it to his mouth. Here, for the first time, a glimpse of the reality of his physical pain. Jesus speaks for all who are thirsty, who long for something to quench the parched realities of life, those who thirst for righteousness, truth, justice, and peace in dry places like where we find ourselves today. This moment so dreadful and the only ones to ask for mercy are his enemies and so he does and there among them even in this most unlikely place is one who offers a drink I wonder about that soldier who he is how he finds himself there in that hard brutal place perhaps out of necessity yet possessing a measure of compassion, as we too sometimes find ourselves in hard and difficult places, able to receive and give mercy. In the beginning, God was digging in the dirt. And God took some of that dirt and with it formed the likeness of a human being and breathed into its nostrils the breath of life. Life itself, breath itself, is a gift from God. Every inhale and exhale of our lungs has been given from the very onset of creation. This was not unknown to Jesus. He would have known that his life was not something that he owned, nor was it given for his own sake. Every breath in was a receiving of grace and strength and life from God, and every breath out was that life given for the sake of the world and the people in it. But one thing that has been reiterated for us in the face of our current health crisis is that, at some point or another, breathing becomes impossible. 
The weight of Jesus' body was suffocating him as he hung on the cross, and he knew that he could not hold on for very much longer. And in his last act, he took the breath that he received in the very beginning and offered it in return to the one from whom it came. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It is finished. What has been set forth has now been completed. Christ has borne our sins and carried our infirmities. In his own body and with his own flesh, he has purchased our salvation. By his precious blood and with each strike upon his back, we have been made whole. That's the promise and hope of it all. This solitary act has opened the door of grace for people of every time and place. The balance of power has shifted from evil to good, from the love of power to the power of love. We are left to take it in and live it out. It is finished. And yet, it has only just begun. We call it Good Friday, but only because we know what is coming. Just before the light is snuffed out, with his last breath and final strength, Jesus offers the world one last sentence, capturing the reality and force of the entire gospel. It is finished. Rest now, holy Jesus, Son of God and Son of Man. Your work is done. The world has done its sinning, and you have done your loving. And at the end, limitless love prevails. Your dying becomes our hope and the hope of the world. Amen.